Buddhists say that it's very difficult to describe the experience of enlightenment. Anything that can be said about it only gives a glimpse of what it means. In order to really understand enlightenment, the Buddha said that you would have to become enlightened. He said that his teachings, the Dharma, were like a finger pointing at the moon. The Dharma can only point to the experience of enlightenment. It can't actually describe it. In order to eventually gain enlightenment themselves, Buddhists study and practice the Dharma and they also follow the Buddha's example. After teaching the five ascetics at the deer park in Sarnath, the Buddha and his now enlightened friends set off on foot in different directions to teach people the truth that the Buddha had discovered. People who met the Buddha were very struck by his appearance, by the way he walked, sat down, ate his food, and talked with people, or just kept quiet. The truth of his teachings could be seen in the way that he lived his life. After meeting him, people had confidence and trust in the Buddha. There had been many great teachers, but none had really embodied such high ideals in the way that they lived. Many people decided on the spot to give up their old ways and follow his teaching. Many people also gained enlightenment by following his example. We can learn a lot from the way in which people live their lives. Dado Rinpoche was a Tibetan Lama, or teacher, who set a great example to those who knew him. Back in the 1950s, he was living in India near the Tibetan border. China invaded Tibet, and many of his people fled from their homeland in terror. Dado was so moved by the suffering of Tibetan refugee children that he decided to start a school for them. The children had risked their lives crossing the mountains to escape the Chinese invaders. Children were roaming the streets, begging for food, many of them orphaned or separated from their parents. For many years, he struggled against all sorts of difficulties to keep the school open. He even sold his possessions to pay the bills and collected bits of wood from the gutter to keep the school warm in the harsh winters. The school survived and, in 1990, with the help of Western Buddhists, this new building was erected. While across the border, the invading Chinese army set about destroying the colorful culture of a Buddhist country, Dado's school aimed to preserve both the culture and the Buddhist values of Tibet. Now, the children enjoy learning the music and dance that has almost disappeared from their homeland. Even more important, they are learning the Dharma, the teaching of the Buddha. If my children learnt only one thing here, I would be happy, Dado once said. If they only learn this, that actions have consequences. The children learn this essential Buddhist principle, along with the five precepts, which teach them how to live a Buddhist life. The five precepts are a system of training followed by Buddhists all over the world. How do Buddhists train themselves? Are the Buddha's five precepts as effective today as they were two and a half thousand years ago? To find out, we join the workers of a Buddhist right livelihood business. This is Wind Horse Trading in Cambridge, England. It's engaged in the gift industry. From this central warehouse, gift shops are supplied all over Britain. The staff here begin their day by chanting the five precepts in Pali, an ancient Indian language. Chanting in Pali reminds them that they belong to the ancient Buddhist tradition and that like Buddhists all over the world, the practice of the precepts is at the center of their lives. Each precept has two parts, behavior which is to be avoided and behavior one should try to develop. In a business like this, it's important that people get decent meals. I'm the cook here. 
Buddhists are vegetarian because we value life, all life. To hurt another person or an animal is to deny that they feel pain, just as I do. So Buddhists are vegetarian because we don't want to harm animals. We believe that the greatest harm that you can do to another living being is to kill it. We know it is perfectly possible to live healthily without eating meat. This is the first precept, to undertake to abstain from harming other living beings. Of course I wouldn't want to go to war or deliberately kill, but it's more than not killing. It's about making sure we're not acting in a violent way towards other living things. Anything we do to someone without their agreement is an act of violence. Bullying is an act of violence. So is acting in an angry or resentful way towards someone. As well as trying not to hurt other people and being vegetarian, I also take care of the environment as much as possible by recycling waste and buying products which don't pollute the planet. The positive aspect of this precept is to develop love, which actively connects me with other beings. It's not a wishy-washy, sentimental sort of love, though, and it's not romantic love. It can be a very passionate feeling. It's a feeling of wishing others well, wanting all beings to be free from any kind of suffering or unhappiness. It takes real courage and perseverance to live by this principle. The non-violent path is not a path for cowards. You have to be strong. One of the qualities of the Buddha is great compassion, a compassion for all living beings. The second precept is to undertake to abstain from taking the not given. We all like to have about us the things that we need. We certainly don't like losing them. If I take someone's possessions, then I'm acting violently towards them. And it's not just a matter of not doing something in case we get found out. Pinching money will have a bad effect on me, even if no one finds out. I'll know that I've done it, that I've acted badly. The positive side of this precept is to be generous and to share as much as possible. I'm one of the managers here, and I take home less money than Brian over in the warehouse administration. This is because we're both trying to live as simple a lifestyle as possible, one of taking only what we need. He's got a family to support, so he needs more than me. Generosity is one of the great qualities of a Buddha. I can develop this quality myself through the practice of giving, giving time, giving money, even little presents. Making an effort to give whenever I have the idea has an amazing effect on me, never mind the other person. The third precept is to undertake to abstain from sexual misconduct. Obviously, a violent act like rape or abuse would be sexual misconduct. Sex itself is a perfectly natural part of being human. We all have a sex drive, but so much harm is caused in the world through people seeking sexual pleasure without taking others into account. So this precept is also about not harming. Sex tends to feature a lot in our society. It's in the newspapers, on TV, and there's a huge advertising industry using it to sell its products telling us that we should look like this, or smell like that, or wear those jeans, or be that shape, if you want to be sexy. This sort of pressure in itself leads to unhappiness for many people. The positive side of the precept is contentment. Being content with who I am and how I look, and being content with the sexual side of my life. So for instance, if I'm in a relationship with someone, then I try to be happy and content with them, rather than looking over my shoulder all the time for someone more interesting. If I'm not in a relationship, then I try to be happy and content with that state too. Basically, it means that sex isn't the most important thing in my life. The Buddha led a very simple life, free from the complications that sex brings. The image of him sitting still in meditation is an image of contentment. The fourth precept is to undertake to abstain from false speech. Speaking 
is something we do all the time. Working here in the shop, I get the chance particularly to concentrate on this precept. False speech doesn't just mean lying. It also means bending the truth or exaggerating it. We often exaggerate a story to make it sound more impressive, or we might make something sound less than it is if we're a bit ashamed of it. We can even mislead people by not saying something. You might think that if Buddhists don't have a god to punish them, well, why would they try to keep the precepts like not telling lies? As the Buddha explained, lying has a bad effect on us. We're not able to become happier and friendlier if we lie and have secrets. That's certainly not what a Buddha is like. The positive counterpart to this precept is truthfulness. This precept takes courage and commitment to practice, especially when the truth isn't popular. It means knowing what the truth is in order to speak it, knowing what you feel and what you think. Um, excuse me, um, what do you think of this hat? I'm trying to decide whether it looks okay. Ah. Mm. Of course you need to be sensitive. Mm. Telling the truth doesn't always mean saying just what you think. We need to be kind in our speech. Well, perhaps not really. No. Um, no? Have you had a look at the other hats? The fifth precept is to undertake to abstain from intoxicants. It's great to have a clear mind. In the past, I thought drinking and taking drugs was fun, but my mind certainly wasn't clear. If I wasn't off my head, I wasn't living. To be honest, I didn't want to admit it, that a lot of the time, I was just out of it. But eventually, I realized I wasn't making anything of my life. And from where I stand now, I can see that I wasn't anything as happy as I am these days. A clear mind is fresh and creative. Of course, drink and drugs aren't the only intoxicants. There's lots of things we can use to distract ourselves, like TV or video games. They can all be addictive. One of the reasons why I meditate every day is to develop this clear mind. If I was to take alcohol or drugs, they'd only make my mind cloudy and dull again. There's a real sense of freedom in being able to think clearly, and I actually have a much deeper and richer experience of life. It's not that anyone says to me, don't drink. The precepts don't work like that. I've decided for myself, because I know from my own experience that drink dulls the mind. The Buddha called this clarity of mind mindfulness. And the Buddha taught that only with a clear mind can you experience real happiness. So the positive counterpart of this precept is to develop mindfulness. The precepts can seem very simple, but put into practice, they have a remarkable effect on people's lives. I cannot buy from the West. Can you either sell it on the local market? Windhorse trading buys some of their goods from Indian businesses. Okay. Orange and green is not, not such good colours. The members of this business are Buddhists and so practice the same precepts. They're part of a new Buddhist movement which was started in 1956 by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Most of these Indian Buddhists live in difficult conditions, but thanks to Dr. Ambedkar, their lives are infinitely better than they once were. Dr. Ambedkar was a great politician, a law minister in the Indian government, but he was born an untouchable that is, someone belonging to the lowest caste in India's social structure. Untouchables were among the poorest and most despised people in India. Not because of what they did, but simply because they were born into a particular caste or level of society. Dr. Ambedkar felt that the caste system, which treated people in such cruel ways, was abominable. Every village had its untouchables. They were forced to live separately away from people of other castes. Their children were not allowed to go to school with other children, or if they did, they had to sit outside the classroom, well away from the other kids and teachers. Dr. Ambedkar 
realized that the only way to escape this ill treatment was to convert to a different religion, one which recognized the precious nature of all human life. He looked carefully at many different religions, but finally decided to become a Buddhist. On the 14th of October, 1956, he and 500,000 of his followers, all untouchables, converted to Buddhism. They wanted to live their lives without restrictions and fulfill their potential as human beings. There are now millions of Buddhists in India who have great admiration and respect for the example Dr. Ambedkar set them. His life showed them that they too could grow and develop. Dr. Ambedkar said that no religion should encourage poverty. Instead, it should promote justice, dignity, brotherhood, and equality. When we were Hindu untouchables, we were told that to suffer like this was part of our karma. But now we know that this is wrong. That's not what Buddhism teaches about karma. The law of karma is that actions have consequences. Everything that we do has an effect on ourselves and on the world. It can have a positive effect or a negative effect. So this means I have the power to shape my own life. I am responsible for whether my life is successful or not. Dr. Ambedkar wasn't just concerned with improving our lives, though. He wanted his peaceful revolution to change the lives of all people. He said that Buddhism is for everyone, young and old, rich and poor, people from any race. Buddhism doesn't discriminate between people. It teaches that in every human being, there is the possibility for gaining enlightenment. If we want to change the world, we have to start with ourselves. In turn, this will have an effect on others. These monks are followers of Vajrayana Buddhism. For Buddhists, the highest ideal is to strive for enlightenment. But the Buddha taught that you can't become enlightened if you ignore your connection with other people in the world. An enlightened person is the embodiment of wisdom and compassion and so would naturally want to help all other beings gain enlightenment too. This is the attitude of a bodhisattva. Bodhisattva means enlightenment being. This is someone who has made it their goal to become enlightened, not just for themselves, but in order to help all living beings to be free from suffering. In other words, for them to become enlightened as well. A Bodhisattva has endless compassion and wisdom to the extent that their natural response to the world is to try to alleviate misery wherever they can. The Tibetan Lama Dado Rinpoche was a great Buddhist who worked for the good of the world. Many people respected Dado and regarded him as a living bodhisattva. When he died in 1990 at the age of 73, People filled the streets of Kalimpong to pay him homage, carrying white silken scarves, a traditional form of offering in Tibet. His body, dressed in silks, was taken for cremation in the stupa especially constructed in the grounds of Goom Monastery. Sonam has vowed that he too will become a bodhisattva. In order to develop the qualities of a bodhisattva, he practices the sort of life a bodhisattva would lead. All his actions, including this ritual worship, are dedicated to helping others. Tibetan Buddhists also use certain rituals in order to help to understand what a bodhisattva is. In this ritual, they try to imagine themselves as bodhisattvas. They even dress in fine robes. 
wear princely crowns over beautiful long black hair. Ritual dress helps them connect more deeply with their ideal. Some Buddhists paint and draw images which express the inner beauty of a bodhisattva in a physical form. For example, this bodhisattva is known as Avalokiteshvara. One story about him goes like this. It is said that many, many centuries ago, Avalokiteshvara was a monk who for much of his life practiced meditation in a cave in the Himalayas. Then. At last, a moment came when he was on the very brink of enlightenment. He experienced tremendous joy and happiness, but at that instant, he heard a sound, a faint sound, which seemed to be coming from a very long way away. As he listened, he heard many voices. They were all crying out, wailing, weeping, grieving. The sound seemed to get louder and louder, until, at last, he looked down. He looked down into the world, and he saw many people, millions of living beings suffering in so many ways, some dying untimely deaths by fire, shipwreck, and execution, others suffering the loss of friends and family, illness, hunger, war. A tremendous compassion welled up in his heart, and the thought came to him, how can I leave these beings? How can I strive for enlightenment just for myself when so many need my help and guidance? And so he made a great vow that he would work to help all beings become free from suffering. If I ever hesitate in my efforts, even for a second, may my body split into a thousand pieces. Avalokiteshvara then entered into a deep meditation on compassion. For a long, long time he sat in meditation. At last he emerged and looked around. But everywhere he could see people continuing to suffer. I have spent all this time in meditation, but have I helped anyone to free themselves? He fell into despair and thought of giving up making an effort. Instantly, Avalokiteshvara's body shattered into a thousand pieces, and he cried out in agony. But out of his great compassion, the shattered pieces of his body took a new shape. His shattered head became eleven heads, now able to look in every direction of space. From his shattered body appeared a thousand arms which could reach out in all directions. Thus. Avalokiteshvara could work for the welfare of beings far more effectively than ever before. The image of Avalokiteshvara is a Buddhist expression in visual form of limitless compassion. There is also a sound associated with him, a mantra which represents compassion in sound. The mantra is Om Mani Padme Hong. It can be translated as the jewel in the lotus. Buddhists believe that we are like lotus buds. Inside each of us is the potential for gaining enlightenment. By practicing the Dharma, the lotus will unfold and the jewel of enlightenment will be revealed.
After Siddhartha gained enlightenment at the age of 35 and became the Buddha, he spent the rest of his life teaching others what he had understood. He attracted a great following of people from all walks of life, and his teachings, the light of the Dharma, spread far and wide. Everyone has precious things in their lives, those things which are the most important to them. For the followers of the Buddha, nothing is more precious than his teachings. The teachings have, at their heart, three great ideals. These ideals are represented in Buddhist art as three precious jewels. For Buddhists, these jewels are not cold, hard crystals. They're on fire. They burn with passion and are blazing with energy, with the fire of transformation. The yellow jewel represents the Buddha. The Buddha is the enlightened teacher. Buddhists believe that through practice, they too can become Buddhas. The blue jewel is the symbol for the Dharma or the teaching of the Buddha. It is by following the Dharma that Buddhists can gain enlightenment for themselves. But what is this third jewel for? This third ideal which all Buddhists revere? Its color is red, the color of love, the color of friendship. The red jewel is a symbol for the Sangha. The Sangha consists of all those who follow the teaching of the Buddha towards the goal of enlightenment. All those who put the three jewels at the center of their lives. This is Kushinara in northern India. After wandering around northern India for 45 years, teaching the Dharma, the Buddha made his final journey to this spot. He was now 80 years old and very tired. This old body is like a rickety cart held together with string, the Buddha said to Ananda, his faithful friend and companion. Like all things, it is impermanent. Knowing his life was reaching its end, and despite being in constant pain, the Buddha set off on a final round of visits to places where he could offer some last words of advice and encouragement. Eventually, they reached the little town of Kushinara. At that time, a stone seat lay here for the town's elders to rest in the cool shade of the sal trees. On this couch, the Buddha lay down on his right side. His followers gathered around and he gave instructions for his funeral arrangements. But this was too much for Ananda to bear. He went away to a nearby hut and leaned against the door, weeping. I am still only a beginner. My teacher, who is so kind, is about to leave us. One of his friends went over to him. Ananda, the teacher calls you. When Ananda returned, the Buddha greeted him with a smile. Do not cry, Ananda. Have I not often told you that we all have to part with our loved ones? You have always been kind to me and have looked after me for all these years. Your efforts will bear fruit. Maintain your practice and you too will gain enlightenment. The Buddha then looked around at the gathering of his followers. Are there any questions about the Dharma? Is there anything that anyone would still like to ask? The followers were silent. If you feel unsure, tell your question to a friend. Still there was silence. Everybody was clear about the Dharma. And so the Buddha uttered his final words. All things are impermanent. With mindfulness strive on. Then he entered into meditation and passed away. At that moment the sal trees suddenly burst into white blossom and showered their large petals over him. Many of his followers were in tears, but those closest to him remained perfectly calm because they knew that the end of the Buddha's life is not death in the ordinary sense at all. His passing away is known as the Parinirvana, which means Supreme Nirvana.
Not long after, a great meeting was called. The main followers of the Buddha met for the first great council near one of the Buddha's favorite places in Raj Gir. They each recited all the Buddha's teachings that they had memorized. They wanted to preserve the Buddha's teachings accurately so that they could be learnt and passed on to as many people as possible. On every full moon night, groups of his followers would gather together to chant the teachings. Many years later, when writing was introduced, the teachings were written down and now vast collections of the Buddha's teachings can be found in many languages. It was not just what the Buddha taught that was important. The way he and his followers put the teachings into practice in their lives provided a model and inspiration for future members of the Sangha. So, not surprisingly, others too began to develop qualities of wisdom, compassion, generosity, fearlessness and tireless energy. As a result, the Sangha began to grow and grow, and the followers of the Dharma, as they called themselves, became established in every corner of India. Buddhists believe that anybody can practice the Dharma and that anybody can gain enlightenment. Lifestyle is not as important as a commitment to practicing with all one's heart. Some ways of life make it easier to practice than others. In the early Sangha, we can see three main lifestyles. First of all, there was the forest dweller. He or she lived like the Buddha, having no home, few possessions, and spending most of their time meditating and talking about the Dharma. Then there were the monks and nuns who lived in settlements, often on the edges of villages. They were especially important for writing down the Dharma and teaching others. Thirdly, there were the lay followers or householders. They were followers who had worldly responsibilities but still wanted to practice the Buddha's teachings. Having money and families, they were especially able to practice generosity and kindness by providing food for the monks, nuns and forest dwellers. All could practice the Dharma following whatever lifestyle that seemed best. All could gain enlightenment and there are countless stories in Buddhist texts of men and women who did. The Sangha spread and spread until, at one time, a third of the population of the world was Buddhist. Back at Bodh Gaya, where it all began, you will always find Buddhist visitors. You will see this strange mixture of people. They speak different languages, have differently shaped faces, different skin colors, and wear different kinds of clothes. From the outside, you can't always tell who is a Buddhist. They certainly don't all wear orange robes and have shaved heads. Perhaps the only way that you can recognize a real Buddhist, a member of the Sangha, is by the way he or she lives their lives whether they are working to develop the same qualities of kindness, generosity, compassion, energy, and wisdom that the Buddha embodied. The qualities that members of the Sangha exhibit are the qualities of true friendship. According to Buddhism, following the path of the Buddha, the path that leads to enlightenment, is the most heroic action a human being can take. It is not easy. Everyone has to battle with laziness, selfishness and distraction. So how do Buddhists manage to stay on this challenging path? Dhirunandi shares this house in Cambridge with other Buddhist women. What seems really important is who we choose to spend our time with. If we're with people who are sincerely trying to make something of their lives and who share the same vision as us, then our own inspiration will be strengthened. We need, if possible, to live with our spiritual friends so that there's no corner of our lives is left hidden away and forgotten. 
By living with such friends, we can develop the kind of friendships where we can be really honest about ourselves, where we can dare to talk about our biggest failings, as well as our greatest strengths. In this way, we get to know ourselves and we get tremendous support and encouragement from each other. The warmth and the friendliness help us open up and trust more, while the challenges help us to see our weaknesses and to see what we need to do to become a happier human being. Well, this is what Sangha is really all about. This is why the Sangha jewel is one of the three great jewels of a Buddhist. Real deep friendship is such a wonderful treasure. With it we can learn so much, we can achieve so much. With the love of a true friend who shares our ideals, we can make our lives quite extraordinary. So many Buddhists choose to live together in these types of communities. They may work together or they may have different jobs or be students. What they have in common is their practice of the Dharma, their determination to practice what the Buddha taught so that they can become more and more like a Buddha themselves. Every morning we sit together in our little shrine room to meditate. This is one of the most important practices of a Buddhist. Most of us have learnt to meditate at Buddhist meditation classes. So anybody can learn to meditate. You don't have to be a Buddhist. More and more people in the West are finding that meditation is a simple, yet very far-reaching method that can help them to change for the better. In meditation, we use the mind to work on the mind, to transform our states of being. So a little bit of meditation every day can affect your whole life. It can help you become calmer, stiller, more concentrated, happier, more positive. So now sit in a comfortable posture, which helps to keep your energy flowing. You can sit cross-legged, or you can sit astride your cushions, or you can even sit on a chair, so long as you can keep your back straight. Lightly closing our eyes to stop the outside world from being distracting. We sit quietly with our hands relaxed, our face relaxed, our shoulders relaxed. Okay, so just as a first exercise, bring your mind onto your breath. Feel your breath as it comes and goes. Enjoy the sensation of breathing. If your mind wanders, then just gently bring it back. Allow your mind to gently concentrate on the breath. This is a beginner's meditation class. They have just begun to meditate. Maybe one day they will experience the mind of a Buddha, a mind that is perfectly clear and still like the waters of a great lake. When the Buddha taught meditation, he said that, at first, our mind is often not clear. He compared it with water in different states. The mind can be like the surface of a lake when a strong wind is blowing. The surface is choppy. Our mind is like this when we are troubled by anxiety, when we are restless. If we let the winds of worry blow themselves out, the surface will be calm once more and we can see into the water. At other times, the mind is like boiling water, bubbling, steaming and hissing away. This is what happens to our mind if we have been acting in an angry way. If we let our anger cool down, our mind will then settle and we will be able to see into it. Sometimes, our mind is like water when it is full of coloured dyes swirling around. It can seem lovely with reds and blues and yellows, but we can't see clearly into the water. This is what happens when we are full of desire for food and comforts. When we let all those thoughts flow away, our mind can become pure and clear again. Sometimes our mind is like water, which is full of weeds growing so thickly that we can't even see the water. 
This is what our mind is like when we are sleepy or lazy. We haven't even got the energy to think. Even worse is when our mind is like a stagnant pond full of evil smelling mud and slime. Then there is no life there at all. This, said the Buddha, is when we have given up, when we don't believe that we can do it, when we don't even want to try. We have no faith in ourselves anymore. We've lost confidence. For Buddhists, faith is believing that they can meditate, that they can keep going, until one day they too will become Buddhas. The Buddha is not a god. But worship of him is an important feature of all the major Buddhist traditions. So why do Buddhists worship? For Buddhists, to worship something is to celebrate its value, to show admiration. The object of greatest admiration possible for a Buddhist is the ideal of enlightenment. So the figure of the Buddha is a symbol of the great hero that Buddhists respect and a representation of what they too can become. The Buddha image represents enlightenment. In the early days of Buddhism, there were no Buddha images. Instead, enlightenment was symbolized by the Bodhi tree and by these structures, stupas. When he was about to die, the Buddha gave instructions for his ashes to be divided so that his followers could place them in monuments known as stupas. These stupas could be the objects of pilgrimage, reminders of the Buddha's achievement. By visiting stupas over the centuries, Buddhists have been able to pay homage to the ideal of enlightenment and remember the teachings and example of the Buddha. Not all stupas contain human remains, but they are still beautiful reminders of enlightenment. They're often found where the Buddha lived and taught. This stupa looks down on Gridrakuta in northern India, the mountain where the Buddha often stayed and where he gave many of his teachings. A few hundred years after his lifetime, carvings and then paintings of the Buddha began to appear. The Buddha image is the symbol most commonly worshipped by Buddhists. Buddhist art has provided some of the world's artistic wonders, perhaps none more sublime than the carvings and paintings in the central Indian caves at Ajanta. These are man-made caves, excavated from about the second century BCE for the use of monks during the rainy seasons. Throughout the rains, the valley would be cut off from the outside world and, as well as meditating and studying the Dharma, the monks would carve and paint these exquisite expressions of their religious ideals. Stories from the life of the Buddha and his teachings illuminate the stone walls of the caves. The Ajanta caves were rediscovered last century and have become a major pilgrimage site for modern Buddhists. These Buddhists have traveled to Bodhgaya from Sri Lanka. They have come to express their devotion to the three jewels by bringing gifts. In addition, as an expression of their gratitude, they have set about decorating the whole temple area. This site at Bodhgaya has served as an important focus of worship for these pilgrims, as do temples and shrines all over the Buddhist world. Sonam and his fellow Tibetan monks 
are preparing for an annual fire puja. Worship, or puja, is practiced in many different ways. To Westerners, Tibetan puja looks particularly colorful and exotic. It is rich in symbolism and can be very complicated. Music, chanting, incense, fire, gestures, movement, ritual objects, and special robes all combine to create a magical atmosphere. But its purpose is the same, to help members of the Sangha contact their positive feelings for the path they are following and express them with body, speech and mind. There are certain key elements which can be recognized in Buddhist worship, no matter which culture we look at. We now go to England and join the Manchester Sangha as they gather for puja, or worship. An atmosphere of happiness and solidarity pervades the room. There is a strong sense of sangha, of a gathering of friends. They are here to pay homage to the ideal of enlightenment. Doing puja helps Buddhists express devotion with their whole being, using body, speech and mind. As they approach the shrine to offer gifts, they bow low with joined palms. The Buddha was often greeted in this way by his early followers. It is a way of showing devotion and respect. Then they offer gifts such as incense or flowers. All these physical expressions of worship help to increase their feelings of devotion. There are three traditional offerings. Flowers make the room fragrant and beautiful while also serving as a gentle reminder of impermanence. When picked, flowers soon die. Each day of life is a precious opportunity the candles lighting up the darkness are a symbol of wisdom, the wisdom of the enlightened mind. The sweet scent of incense pervades the whole room. As with the smoke from this incense, actions have an effect on the world around. Most of this puja is performed in English, with some chanting in the ancient Indian languages of Pali and Sanskrit. We can now hear the sounds of a mantra being chanted over and over again in Sanskrit. Mantras don't always have a literal meaning. They are mainly sound symbols which express some aspect of enlightenment. As they chant, the worshippers concentrate on what the sounds stand for and on developing a sense of devotion to the Buddha. Symbol and ceremony play an important part in the life of the Sangha. But the practices are not ends in themselves. It is feelings of devotion and determination that are important. The deep emotional positive response which develops is portrayed in a symbol, the wind horse. A great white stallion strides joyfully and determinedly through the sky, high above the clouds. Its proudly pacing feet are a fire and it leaves a trail of rainbows in its wake. On its back, on a lotus-shaped saddle, sit the three jewels which sparkle and flash and haloed in fire. The wind horse bears these three precious ideals with great love to every living creature throughout the universe. May all beings be well. May all beings be happy. <laughs> 